All right. Good evening. Welcome, everyone. Uh, today we have uh, Bug Bounties Explained with uh, Wes Weinberg from Getting Started to Making It to Number One. Um, I think it's going to be quite fun with Wes's experience, extensive, I would say, experience with Bug Bounties. So with that, Wes, over to you. Awesome. I'm share my screen here. If I can find the present button. All right, is that working? People see a slide? Sweet. Um, yeah, so thanks for having me. This is actually my uh, first DC604 uh, event as well here. So um, like Amrin said, I'm gonna be talking about bug bounties. Um, and bug bounties are kind of a buzzword in the security industry right now. So um, I'm actually really excited to talk about it despite that. Um, normally I'm not a big buzzword kind of guy. Um, I really like to kind of cut through the hype on things and get down to what's real, what's not real. Um, and uh, so I'm kind of hoping that I can get through some of that for this topic. Um, and that's why I made my title Bug Bounties Explained because I'm hoping to kind of uh, explain how, that, how, that, how it actually works in the real world. Um, and so, like I said, this is my first DC604 meeting, so I'm not sure the normal format that, that things are maybe done and how formal or informal things are. Uh, but for today, if possible, I'd like to uh, keep things interactive. Um, I'm not a huge video conference person. Uh, back in the olden days, uh, they used to make me do webinars back when WebEx wasn't owned by Cisco and you'd have to do it for training. So I think the trauma of that just made it so I unconsciously hate all video meeting conference things these days. Um, so hopefully I'll try and make it not too, not too unbearable. And actually I'd like it if we could get um, a lot of interaction throughout this. Um, so maybe even right now, everyone that's on this call, if you uh, have anything that you're kind of wondering about or areas or even just like you saw the topic and you thought hey I wonder about whatever it might be um, kind of kind of start to think about that and in a few minutes uh, after I go through a little bit of an introduction and uh, the beginning I'm going to ask uh, if there's certain areas that people would like me to talk to um, when I was putting together some thoughts on this and putting together some slides uh, there's about 100 different areas that I thought I could start going into rabbit holes on. So rather than do that, I'd, I'd kind of just like to leave it open to what everyone here is interested in hearing about. Um, and so I'll explain a little bit about myself and my background, but before I do that, I just wanted to start with uh, some real basics here. So uh, the, first, the first kind of important question is, well, what is a bug bounty? Um, I think that's kind of important for any buzzword you hear. Uh, what, what does it actually mean? Uh, so the way I describe like the a bug bounty, you've got a bug, you've got a reward, so you've got a bug bounty. Uh, technically speaking, I think that's the uh, correct definition for what a bug bounty is. Um, but since bug bounties are kind of a buzzword and everyone talks about them, uh, technical definition is not really what most people mean when they say bug bounty. So if you hear bug bounty in the news or you hear a company talking about bug bounty or something like that, usually what that means is usually there's a company or organization um, and they have a bounty program where you can submit a bug for a reward. Um, now, there's the rare occasion where you can actually just submit any sort of software bug and get a reward, uh, but that's not usually what bug bounties mean. Bug bounties are usually uh, focused on the security industry. And most of the uh, companies that run a bug bounty specifically exclude regular bugs. If you've just got some problem and the app just, you know, doesn't draw on the screen when it's supposed to, uh, they'll tell you that's nice and, you know, you can file a support ticket and they'll ignore it. Um, they, uh, for a bug bounty, only really want to see bugs that have a security impact. So, so they're basically looking for security vulnerabilities and then they'll offer some type of reward for that. So um, how this actually works in practice, I'm going to get to in the next bit. I think we can go over a lot of different variations of this and all kinds of things like that throughout my talk. Uh, but this is, this is kind of the starting point for any bounty program. You've got to have 
you gotta have bugs and you gotta have rewards. Otherwise, there's no bug bounty program. All right. Um, the next thing I think uh, you kind of always need to understand if you want to know about bug bounties is uh, where they came from and when they when they occurred. So um, I was looking through, I was looking for some material unrelated to this talk and I came across a slide deck from Bug Crowd um, and I saw this slide and I really liked it. So I, I made a note to steal it at some point. Uh, so that's what I did here. Um, so uh, this kind of does a good job. It, it definitely is like written from a bug crowd perspective because it's completely ignoring a bunch of pretty important events on the chain. Uh, but it does a good job of describing the past history. So the way um, the first bug bounty that people always talk about, I don't know if it's really the first bug bounty, but it's the widely recognized one is way back in 1995, Netscape um, did something like offer $50 for any vulnerabilities you could find in their product. I don't know if it was bugs or vulnerabilities or both. Um, at that time, I had never heard about it, so it can't have been that widely have published. Uh, but apparently that was the first kind of example of a company offering to pay for uh, bugs. Um, the next step is probably the most important step in the chain it is when uh, Bug Crowd says iDefense is the first company that did it. That might be true. I don't, I don't know for certain. Uh, but iDefense started offering to buy vulnerabilities. So actually a bit different than bug bounties. And these days, um, no one would call this a bug bounty. But it was the first example of uh, a public company, at least, offering to pay money for security vulnerabilities. Um, I think it was a little bit controversial at the time because they were paying for vulnerabilities in other companies' software. Um, and so that's kind of where the whole exploit sales industry uh, became public and started off. Um, after that, uh, Mozilla apparently had a bug bounty. Um, and then uh, the Zero Day Initiative got started in 2005. Uh, I feel like this is when it really started to make it to the mainstream news and people started hearing about it. Uh, because shortly afterwards, Pwn to Own started up in 2007, uh, which was an event at Cansec West um, down at the Sheraton Wall Center. Uh, each year originally, um, where they would do basically a tournament. And so they'd pick a few targets, uh, iPhones, Windows laptop, that kind of thing. And they'd invite people to bring their exploits and see if they could just hack a, a freshly installed system. Um, and they partnered with uh, Zero Day Initiative uh, later on to do that. And the two, Ponto owns kind of a yearly event, Zero Day Initiative accepts vulnerabilities all year long. And both of those things are actually still ongoing even today. Um, the next, uh, probably the next important steps were when uh, Google, Facebook, um, and then eventually Microsoft, uh, so three of the biggest tech companies, they all got board, on board with the idea of why don't we make it so that people can send, not only send vulnerabilities to us in our products and in our systems, but we'll pay them for it. So unlike the previous examples, um, other than Mozilla and Netscape, uh, this was companies saying, we'll only pay for vulnerabilities in our own software, but we do want to know about them and we do want to reward people for uh, reporting them. So uh, 2010, 2011, that started off. And from what I recall, that was actually on a very small scale. Both Google and Facebook did that. Um, where things uh, kind of actually launched and started happening in a big way for bug bounties was in 2013. So Bug Crowd um, and some others, Synac, Hacker One, they all started in that time frame. Um, and they initially started fairly small, but uh, kind of with the model of we can sign up customers who are interested in receiving vulnerabilities um, and we can facilitate the process of reviewing those and deciding what payouts should be, but we're gonna make it possible for people to report uh, vulnerabilities to us and get paid for them. And so from there, uh, it's kind of launched off and really taken off. The first few years was a bit slow, but I'd say for the last five years, every year, more and more it's in the news. There's tons of people doing it, tons of companies doing it. Um, so that's kind of where it started and uh, came from. So the 
the thing that's not shown on this chart that's important to realize and why I like to why why I thought it's worth showing this chart is prior to 2010, there was really no way to have a vulnerability in say Microsoft Hotmail and get paid for it. I could have that vulnerability and I could try to sell it, but I'd have to find some pretty shady people that wanted to hack someone's Hotmail, for example, and were willing to pay me money for that. Um, and they would also have to kind of trust that I wasn't going to report them. So I'd, I'd have to, I'd have to be a pretty shady person. I'd have to know some pretty shady people. It'd be pretty hard to sell vulnerabilities um, in these systems. Um, and not only that, it would actually be pretty hard to report vulnerabilities in these systems. So if I wrote Microsoft an email back in 2009, let's say, and said, hey, I found this problem in Microsoft Hotmail, it's unlikely I'd be able to get in contact with the security team, unlikely that I'd be able to find the right people to actually fix it. If I did, I'm sure they would fix it, uh, but companies weren't really structured to accept a lot of outside input as to the security of their systems and their products. And so once bug bounties became a thing, it also really launched companies to be able to interact with security researchers in a much more direct way. Um, and so that's kind of the, been the biggest shift because I remember, um, I'll call it in the olden days, but pre-2010, um, on a few occasions considering like, hey, how, sh how should I contact a company to report this? Um, but quickly discovering most companies just don't have any way to deal with a vulnerability that's reported. They're not against the idea of it. They just don't have any one person that's in charge of it. So bug bounties have really made a big shift in terms of public reporting of vulnerabilities. All right. Um, so I'll, I'll talk very briefly about myself, just kind of so you know uh, where I'm coming from on all of this. Some of you guys might know me, but uh, I'm sure many of you do not. Uh, so I live in Vancouver. I uh, grew up in Vancouver. Um, for a couple of years, I moved down to Seattle uh, and worked for Microsoft, but for the most part, I've always been in Vancouver. Um, I've been doing InfoSec professionally since 2008. I spent a lot of years in my life before that learning about it, um, but actually started working in it uh, back in 2008. Um, I initially started off uh, doing more uh, InfoSec consulting type work. Um, and I've really worked in quite a variety of different areas. Um, I know some people were talking uh, before, I, before this started here about what field in InfoSec do you want to go into? What specialization do you want? And there's like a million of them. And even I feel that. I feel like I've been doing InfoSec my whole life, but there's still tons of areas I could learn about. Um, that said, pretty much everything on the offensive side of InfoSec, I've got some experience with at least. Um, so I started off uh, doing a lot of embedded device security, hardware and firmware, that type of thing, um, and eventually moved more into web, mobile, uh, all kinds of different areas. Uh, bug bounties started off, I first became aware of them in 2013. Uh, bug Crowd was running some event, partnering with the conference, and I kind of heard about it uh, and thought it was a super cool idea. Um, so I've been involved in them in some way or another since 2013. Uh, I actually got a job for one of the companies that runs bug bounty programs, um, and I worked for them for a few years. Um, and then since 2018, I've been doing bug bounties full time. So I worked for Microsoft from 2016 to 18 on one of their red teams. Um, and then I decided to make the switch and just do bug bounties full time. Uh, so in my time doing bug bounties, I've submitted way more than a thousand vulnerabilities that have been accepted. Um, so I found a lot of stuff, reported a lot of stuff, had a lot of success. Um, and basically this is kind of my full-time job. I do this uh, all day, every day, except when I'm taking vacation, which is a super nice benefit of bug bounties. Uh, if you're doing that as your job, you don't report to anyone. So you just manage your own time. Uh, yeah, so that's... I think my history in a really brief nutshell. Uh, let me see what I got next for slides. Current bounty companies. All right, I'm gonna go over this slide um, and then I'm gonna ask uh, for input from everyone. So be prepared. <laughs> so uh, the chart of kind of where bug bounty started off in their history, 
um, doesn't really capture who's doing bug bounties today. So I made this list just out of my own opinions. I'm sure tons of people are missing and tons of people uh, would be mad if they thought of this as the only list of companies doing <laughs> uh, But there's kind of two groups of companies. Uh, some companies are doing their own bounty programs, managing it themselves. So that would be companies like Google, Microsoft, Apple. If you find a vulnerability in Google, uh, you can report it through their bug bounty program and they host that themselves. They'll review it themselves and they'll pay you themselves. Um, same for Microsoft, same for Apple. Um, then there's uh, what I'd call managed bug bounty companies. Um, so these are ones like Bug Crowd, Hacker One, and Synac. Um, for, so for these companies, uh, they enlist their own set of customers. Um, so say, I don't know, pick any company, say General Electric. I don't know if they have a bounty program, but if they do, they would probably sign up through Hacker One, Bug Crowd, uh, Synac as a customer. And so from the researcher side of things, you would join one of these platforms and then they would be one of the targets that you could um, participate in their bug bounty program challenge. Uh, on the right side of my screen here, uh, I got a little screenshot. HackerOne just sent out a survey like two days ago. And one of their questions was, well, what platforms do you hack on? So I decided that if this is good enough for HackerOne in terms of list of bounty companies, then it's good enough for me. Um, so there's also uh, some smaller companies, Cobalt, Integrity. Um, there's a few others um, that have started a little bit more recently. Um, and some of them are more region specific. So there's a few, uh, like I think maybe Yes We Hack is more Europe focused, if I'm getting that right. Um, others of them just focus on a specific industry or they're just kind of trying to make their way up and they're, they're not as big as the other ones. Uh, so the big managed companies are HackerOne, BugCrowd, and Synac. You've probably heard of at least one of those companies because they also have a pretty big marketing budget. Um, so they try and get their name out there as much as possible. Um, HackerOne, as an example, has well over a thousand customers um, at any given time. So they've got a lot of targets and a lot of systems they're um, running bounty programs for. There's a couple of questions, Wes, in the chat. Uh, one from Dana. So do you focus on a few specific private programs inside of BugCrowd or do you focus on a lot of different targets? Yeah, so let me pull up my slides and see if I should move forwards or not. I got uh, this tablet thing for presenting on, but I don't normally use it as a computer. No, I think I'll just answer that. So um, I primarily work on HackerOne and Synac right now. Um, in the past, I've done Microsoft's bounty program a fair amount. Uh, I have never done anything for Apple. Google I've looked at briefly, but never really participated in. Uh, mostly I've been working on the managed programs. Um, so on Synac, um, that's where I've done most of my uh, bounty testing work. Um, so in 2019, 2020, I was the top tester there. Um, the past year, uh, another person stole that title from me, but that's okay. Um, and then on HackerOne, I've been doing more of that lately. Um, I'll talk a little bit about, about it more, li more later, um, but each platform has kind of their own approach for how they run uh, bounties. So as a really brief example, um, Synac only, Synac has a pretty extensive onboarding process. They don't just let anyone sign up. Um, and then once you're, uh, once you're registered with them, you get access to all of their targets. HackerOne instead, they'll send you invites to private programs uh, based on the number of vulnerabilities you've got accepted. So they have both public and private programs, um, but you only get access to the private ones as you have findings accepted. So they kind of make you work kind of through the slow iterative process to get access. Um, so for myself, I've done work on all three of the major platforms, but primarily I work on HackerOne and Synac. I think part of the question was also around, do you like pick a target and go deep or try to go wide across multiple targets at a time? Yeah, and so I actually have got a slide on that in a little bit. 
Um, and I will definitely get to that because that's a key point of bug bounty strategy, I feel like. Um, so I, I'm, I haven't scrolled through the chat here uh, yet exactly, yet really. Um, but are there some areas in general, some questions in general that people are wondering? Um, I think what I... There's, there's another one. Mark is asking, is exclusivity, exclusivity a requirement? I.e., if an org signs up with a bug bounty company, are they restricted from signing up with another? Or I guess running their own. Yeah, and so that's a that's a fun fun question actually. Um, so I'll answer that quick, and then I'll ask my question because I thought of I thought of what I want to go to next. Um, so no, as far as I know, none of the companies restrict their customers in any way, and so actually the clever customers. What they do, and I've seen this happen multiple times across multiple companies, is they'll phone up the salesperson at HackerOne, they'll phone up the salesperson at BugCrowd, they'll phone up the salesperson at Synac, and they'll say, hey, you offer uh, some sort of like initial trial, like I'm interested in your service. And as far as I understand, all three of them do. They'll give you one week or something like that. So then they say, okay. Uh, we're just trying to decide which is the best platform. And of course, the salesperson says, oh, we're definitely the best platform. We'll find you all the things. It won't be expensive. You'll love us. And they say, yeah, yeah, okay, that's good. Uh, that's what the other two told us. So we're going to run with all three of you against the same target and see who ends up with the best findings. Um, so some companies actually uh, kind of play the companies off against each other, which I think is really funny, uh, especially as a tester. If I'm registered on two platforms and I see the same customer come up on both, uh, that's, that's really funny slash silly. Um, but yeah, so that happens. Um, it's possible. I'm sure the salespeople would try to put in some sort of exclusivity requirement, but I don't think any companies ever agree to it. So as far as I know, that's not a rule. Um, so yeah, I think that actually ties to one of the things that I was wondering. Um, for DC604, I'm guessing that most of the people here are more on the interested as a bug bounty researcher side of things. But uh, for anyone that might work for a company, is anyone interested in kind of the perspective and what you should know if you're a company and you're interested in getting a bug bounty run against you? Or should I really just focus on the side of, hey, I'm interested in being a bug bounty tester and I'm not going to be my own company hiring a bounty program? So the question is basically, is anyone from the company side of things, should I talk to that at all or should I mostly ignore that? I'd be interested, but I'm not sure if anybody else is. Okay, I got a few yeses, so that's good. Um, and then uh, my second question is, um, Is anyone just really new to the idea of bug bounties or has everything I've said so far been a uh, super review for everyone and I should really get to more strategy and details and uh, what's everyone's feel? Are you feeling lost already or are you feeling like you're getting bored super fast? It looks like it's a mix. It's a mix, okay. Just people well, who are brand new. And I bet there's people who want the details, the, the juicy details. Yeah, okay. So I'm gonna keep going on a few more slides. Keep thinking of those um, questions, keep jumping in. There, there's another one. Can I just quickly read it? Yeah. Um, that we missed. Okay, it's so all way past now. Okay, uh, Nathan is asking, uh, does the route to CNAC via hack the box path allow you to bypass the interview process for CNAC? Is it worth it? Do you know? Um, it's always changing. Synag is very against having any sort of consistency. Um, that goes against their beliefs, from what I can tell. I worked there for a few years, so that matches. Um, they, for a while, were allowing people to do invites, and for a while, we're doing a CTF every so often, and we're also doing Hack the Box. Um, as far as I can tell, they don't want to have too many researchers registered at any time but they also don't like kicking researchers out. So they constantly are hesitating to add new people. Um, so my guess would be try and do all of the things that they suggest are routes to get approved faster and then maybe contact them and be like, hey, I did like six of your requirements, even though only one's needed. 
please consider me. Um, I don't really know if there's a better or easier way to get on with them. Uh, I know some people that are on the other programs and are kind of mad that they can't get on to Synac. Um, and then I know other people that just show up on Synac really easily. So it's, uh, I don't know a great answer for that, but I do know that uh, just recently, for example, they said they weren't going to be doing any more invite people. Uh, but I don't know if that just means that they're actually going to start prioritizing on things like hack the box. All right, I'm going to go to the next slide. So um, what is a bounty program, though? I mean, I've talked about it a bunch, but what does it actually look like in the real world? Uh, so I thought the right image for this would just be a picture of Burp Suite. Um, so the important thing to think about when it comes to bounty programs depends whether you've got any background in security first or if you're still kind of new to all of it. So when I got into bounties, I had been working in computer security for quite a while. Um, and I had a lot of expectations as to what a bounty program should cover. Um, but what it should and what it does cover are two completely different things. So if you would normally pen test a company and then you think, oh, this would be a good transition to bounties, it's kind of true, but bounties run under a completely different operating structure. So bug bounty programs, uh, like I started with, I mean, as a technical definition, it's a bug and a reward, you've got a bug bounty. Um, in practice, um, on all three of the big uh, sites, HackerOne, BugCrowd, Synac, 90% of the targets that they have available for bug bounties are gonna be websites, web applications, web-based stuff. Um, the independent companies like uh, Google and Apple and Microsoft, they generally also pay for vulnerabilities in their software. So Apple actually doesn't really want web vulnerabilities, but they'll accept them is how they've described it. Um, they really want vulnerabilities in things like their iPhone, um, their hardware, their, their kind of important products. Um, so independent companies often will accept um, actual software exploits. Bounty programs rarely accept software exploits. Um, so 90% uh, web targets, uh, depending on who's running the program and kind of what they want. Sometimes it's network or host targets. So sometimes it is a lot more like a pen test. Uh, occasionally they'll give you internal network access. Often it's just internet access to get access to the targets. So you're you're at no more of an advantage than anyone else that might be trying to break into a company. Um, mobile apps are quite often included in a bounty program, um, but often they don't uh, have anything different than their web target would have. And often it's the combination of both that's there. Um, so I said 5%, but that 5% is more like unique mobile apps where something's different than just their website. Um, and 2% other. So there's lots of overlap. The number never adds up to 100. There's always something random that a company will try. Uh, the problem is if you do something like a hardware assessment uh, and you know, say we want everyone to hack our iPhones for our bounty program, everyone immediately says, well, I'm gonna need to buy an iPhone to hack then. Can you send me one? And uh, you're waiting for shipping times and this and that. It, it gets to not be a good fit for the bug bounty model. Web apps fit the bug bounty model really well. So in practice, if a company says we have a bug bounty, uh, what that means is we have a set of web targets that people can hack and report vulnerabilities to us. And we might have some other stuff, but it's definitely not gonna be the focus. And so that ties into this, which I think is probably the most important description of the standard operating procedure. Uh, I just bought a copy of Office 2021 and it comes with this really weird set of stock art people. So I was, I was excited for that uh, as an aside. So for bug bounties, as opposed to a pen test, as opposed to a threat assessment, as opposed to doing your security architecture, as opposed to any number of other things in the security world, um, there's kind of an unwritten set of rules that all the companies expect. So the first and probably most important is you need a proof of concept. So when I'm doing a pen test, I'll often include things where something's clearly not a best practice, is clearly going to be a problem, but isn't actually exploitable for some sort of security impact right now. Um, 
so maybe the example is there's an open file share on everyone's computer and you can copy files to it but right now there's no files there um i mean that's probably not a good situation someone's going to try and copy some executable files with funny icons so people think it's a word doc and you're probably going to get a shell if you can just write files to everyone's computer in the whole company definitely a finding for a pen test but if you submitted that to a bounty program they would probably say well i mean maybe someone will click it maybe they won't until someone clicks it we're not going to accept this as a finding um, things like that so they want you have to be able to exploit it here and now and show the result so if you can get um, access to the database right now and see the contents you've got a vulnerability if they're running a million year old version of the database but you can't do anything with it uh, the bounty companies don't care they won't pay you for it they won't accept it um, the next thing is winner takes all so bounty programs are really uh, kind of a fun way to do a giant race um, and they kind of kind of goes back to the pwn to own idea of things so the way that pwn to own was run was that everyone registered into the lottery of who got to try first and then the first person gets to try to run their exploit if it doesn't work the next person gets to try uh, but really whoever gets there first is going to be the most likely uh, to win um, so with bug bounties uh, it doesn't matter if uh, you find it five minutes before me and then I find the exact same thing I'll get nothing the person that submitted it five minutes before me will get all the credit um, on the rare occasion some programs will alter this structure uh, so some examples I can think of are uh, hacker one will run live events and for those what they do is they have a time period where uh, at the start where the first day or first few days or however whatever time period they decide a few days usually every vulnerability that gets sent in um, gets considered and if five people send in the same vulnerability they split it five ways across the five people so instead of winner takes all um, it's just evenly split um, the other example that i can think of is uh, microsoft a little while ago maybe a year ago uh, they announced that if they know about a vulnerability internally, but they haven't actually fixed it uh, publicly, um, they'll still pay for it. Um, in other cases, a lot of times companies will say, we knew about that issue. So yes, you've reported it, but you weren't the first to tell us about it. We actually already knew. Um, like I was mentioning before, there's some differences between pen testing and bug bounties. Um, there's also kind of some difference just in terms of real world attacks versus what you're allowed to do for a bug bounty. So I'd call it like tying both your hands behind your back. So uh, if you find a vulnerability and it gets you access to uh, a database and the database has everyone's username and password, including the admins, but you only have a user level account, you're not allowed to pull the admin password, log as an admin and see what you can find from there. Um, vulnerabilities, you have to, do what a lot of places call stop and report once you find it you need to write it up and send it to them you're not allowed to do any sort of post exploitation activities uh, according to the rules for the programs uh, another interesting one is that um, on many of the bounty programs hacker one uh, bug crowd usually um, they have what i'd call an o-day waiting period so if a new vulnerability came out um, a good example is uh, just a week, two weeks ago, um, there's a bunch of Apache vulnerabilities coming out. So you can get a directory traversal, get code execution, get SSRF, um, all just based on pretty common Apache configurations. Um, so most of the hacker one customers have a 60 day waiting period. So they say, well, hey, it's not super fair that you're gonna race our security team to report that issue and we're gonna pay you for it. You have to give us two months to fix that. If in two months it's still not fixed, then you can report it and we'll consider it a valid finding. Um, the notable exception to this is at Synac, they don't have any waiting period on any of their targets. If you find an O-Day, you can send it in right away. Um, and actually that means you can kind of go O-Day hunting yourself and if you find a new O-Day, you can report that against a customer uh, that might be running the vulnerable software. 
Um, the other big thing uh, that can be pretty frustrating for bounty hunters and people in general is the scope that companies will go with. So um, where did I have it? 90% web targets. Uh, when that says 90% web targets, my example, General Electric, if they have a bug bounty, they're not going to say, hey, anything in the 3.IP space that we own internally and anything at GE.com that uh, anything at a GE subdomain, usually they don't say that. Usually they say, uh, we would like to put into scope store.ge.com and that is our bug bounty. Um, this can be frustrating because if then GE gets hacked, they go on the news and they say, well, you know, we've got a bounty program. We wish people just reported stuff responsibly. Um, but actually what you're allowed to report for the bounty program is pretty limited. Um, and that goes with the next piece too. Uh, for most companies, they only allow testing against their staging or test environment. Maybe not most, maybe half the companies. Um, they choose test and staging environments instead of production environments. And there can be some good reasons for that uh, because bounty testing can kind of be like a free a denial of service test as well. Um, a lot of people just spin up a thousand threads and hit go. Um, and then you get a hundred people doing that and it can be pretty rough on your infrastructure. Um, so a lot of companies will make staging and test environments the things you test. I feel like I need to take a break here on this slide already. Um, yeah, so you need a proof of concept. First person to get it wins. There are a bunch of rules and restrictions. It's not a free for all. Um, if you break these rules and restrictions, you usually get banned from a lot of the platforms for a week and then a month and then forever. Um, they, they really want testers to follow the rules that companies are allowing. Uh, there's a couple of questions. Are there bounty hunting groups or mostly individuals? Yeah, so that's a, that's an interesting area. So from what I've seen, there's a bit of both. Um, and I wonder if I got another slide on this. Let me see. No, not really. Um, so on the bounty programs, a lot of them are structured so that uh, you don't get public access. They're only invite only programs. So they're on somewhere like Synac or Bug Crowd, um, or if they're on Hacker One, they're not a publicly visible one. They're one that you have to get invited to. But there's actually levels of invites that all of these uh, companies use. So their their top testers get invited to a lot of the more exclusive targets, I guess. Um, and usually those are just targets where the customer is extra worried that people are going to do things they're not supposed to, or the customer is only able to set up 20 test accounts and they can't add a thousand people to it. Um, so inevitably what this means is the people with access to the most programs can kind of choose from the easiest and best targets to work on. Um, so from what I've seen, there's usually like a hundred top bounty testers in the world. And so most of them kind of know of each other. Uh, one of the things that, um, I don't know if I have a slide on it, but is a standard operating procedure is, uh, on my definition, you've got bugs, rewards, bug bounty. Rewards aren't necessarily money. Um, so one of the things that a lot of people doing bug bounties want is recognition. So companies will have a hall of fame for who's reported the best or most vulnerabilities. Um, all of the big platforms, HackerOne, BugCrowd, those guys, um, they have a public uh, leaderboard of who's reported the most or who has the most points. They don't do it in terms of vulnerabilities normally, they do it in terms of points. So um, HackerOne has a quarterly point system scoreboard uh, along with a yearly scoreboard um, and they kind of hide it. But if you look, you can also find an all-time scoreboard. And so... Uh, that makes it easy to kind of see who's been successful recently, uh, who's been successful in the long term, and who isn't. So then all that to say, um, there's several uh, Slack servers and a few Discord servers where uh, a lot of the, the kind of full-time bounty people or the top bounty people hang out. And so from what I've seen, there's very few actual groups of people doing bug bounties. Um, sometimes that's just because of the rules. So a place like Synac only allows 
uh, one account per person. I can't share that account with other people. Um, they have NDAs for everything. You're not allowed to just disclose to your friends that you want to work with you on it. Um, they do let uh, people who are all registered onto SYNAC work together, but you can't bring in outsiders as part of your group. Um, places like HackerOne and especially public programs, that's not really a uh, as much of a rule. Um, but usually I've seen often groups of two or three people that kind of know each other will collaborate. Um, so all of the, maybe not all the platforms, Synax still working on it. But HackerOne and BugCrowd allow for what they call bounty splitting, specifically with the idea of if there's a group of five of you working on a finding, rather than try and make you fight over it, <clears throat> they can just pay the five of you directly. Um, so I would say, I would say groups of like two to five are the most common. I don't really know of any large bounty hunting groups, um, but I do know a lot of collaboration across researchers, even if they're not officially grouped up with each other. Um, people kind of know what other people's specialties are and will often trade off that way. Do you think the recent CSA mandate in the States will be a boost to bug bounty programs? Mark, I know you posted the link. I haven't read that mandate. I don't know, Wes, if you know anything about it. Yeah, I was going to say, I hear about new mandates, <laughs> mandates so I'm not sure necessarily. Make everything is. secure, is which my understanding from the title. Um, that's been one of the really interesting things that's not on that history slide, is what to me was surprising, um, and that's kind of notable, because I've been doing security for a really long time that I'm really old and bitter, even if I don't look like it. Um, so for me to be surprised, it's, I, I don't know, it doesn't happen that often. And uh, actually one of the biggest uh, customers of bounty programs these days um, is federal governments. So the US government's a huge bounty customer. Um, governments around the world though, are also really big into the bug bounty scene. Um, despite having some pretty important systems, sometimes some pretty sensitive data, um, they're big uh, believers in the bug bounty system, in the bug bounty world. Um, so whether they've got a mandate or even if they haven't, they're, I've just seen a lot of one department does a bounty and then six months later I see 10 more related departments running a bounty. Like the word just kind of gets out. Um, I think a mandate would definitely help. Um, and I'll kind of get to it on some later slides. Bug bounties also aren't your one-stop solution for security. Um, in a lot of cases, you should actually be spending your security budget on entirely different things. Uh, but from my perspective as just a bug bounty tester alone, um, I think the more mandates that happen, the more targets they'll be, and that uh, won't be a bad thing. All right, there was another question I think that we missed. Uh, so when researchers release their research, however however obscure, I'll assume a lot of bu bug bounty hunters rush to create an exploit. If when a POC is submitted, does that put a freeze on further submissions? I'm not sure, Mark, if you want to clarify that. I'm not sure I understand it. I think I could talk to that. <clears throat> so... Um... My next bullet point here that I haven't talked about yet, but is there, vulnerable become property of the company. Um, what that kind of means is uh, same as if you're writing, similar to if you're writing code for a company, they usually make you sign an agreement that says the code you write for this company is now property of the company. Um, if you send in a vulnerability, right? My hypothetical GE bug bounty, I send in a vulnerability in a GE dishwasher. Um, that vulnerability in that GE dishwasher disclosed to GE, they can now choose to do what they want with. They can ignore it, they can fix it, they cannot fix it. Um, but usually it requires an NDA. Usually you're not allowed to disclose it and then go public with it until you get permission from the company. Um, and you're not allowed to tell the company, hey, I'm telling you this about it. And if you don't pay me, you're not allowed to fix it. It works the other way around. If you send it in, they immediately own it and they decide if they wanna pay you. Um, so then to the question of, well, what happens if uh, an obscure vulnerability gets published 
and people rushed to make a proof of concept. Um, the if you make a proof of concept and this does happen, um, you can try to submit it to as many programs as possible, actually. So it's kind of a, a weird market dynamic where if you know that 100 Hacker One customers have G dishwashers hooked up to the internet, it might be worthwhile to you to try and find an exploit in that GE dishwasher because then you can exploit it against 100 Hacker One customers and in theory get paid 100 times. Um, if someone's done this and reported it and then uh, someone else comes along and they make an exploit, but they're just a bit slower, if it's the same underlying vulnerability, it'll get rejected as a duplicate. They'll say, hey, we already got reported this. Wes was faster at hacking our dishwashers that are on the internet. So no bounty for you. Um, the other interesting thing is, and especially at Hacker One, this is a, a bug bounty insider secret. Um, Hacker One allows their triage staff, the people reviewing the vulnerabilities, to participate in other Hacker One bounties. So I could send in a GE dishwasher vuln. The person could triage it and say, well, there's 200 other Hacker One targets that I am not doing the triage for. I'm allowed to work on as a bounty tester. And nothing really stops them from being like, well, now I know how this dishwasher proof of concept works. I'll recreate it myself and submit it in before Wes can get to those programs. Um, same thing for the customer. I could submit my GE dishwasher vulnerability to AMB Sound, and they could be doing bug bounty testing on their own for fun and submit it to a bunch of HackerOne programs. So usually if researchers do have these O days that maybe didn't have a proof of concept, but they've made their own and they're trying to get it in fast, usually they'll script it. So they kind of test it against a ton of programs and are ready to send it into all of them when they can. Yeah, I, I guess there's a bit of uh, like that situation that uh, when James Cattle did his uh, HTTP request splitting research and then there was a bunch of submissions across multiple research or bug bounty hunters across multiple programs based on the same thing. And also kind of, I think you touched on the, the fact that ultimately a lot, some of the vulnerabilities are weird in a sense that there might be vulnerabilities in third party services that the customer that's doing the, that's running the bug bounty uh, is not controlling, but you can still submit it not to like AWS, but to individual uh, bug bounty platforms, even though they can't do much about them. Yeah, exactly. So sometimes it will be in a third party service. Um, often if a company really cannot do anything to fix it themselves, um, like in the case of the dishwasher, they could actually just disconnect it from the internet because it has no good reason to be on the internet. Um, but say you find an AWS vuln and, you know, it gets me access to any S3 bucket. Most companies will say, hey, you know, that's really an Amazon vulnerability. It's really not a us vulnerability. So yes, you can hack our service with that, but it doesn't really make sense for us to pay you for that. You should just send that to Amazon is usually how that's handled. Um, the one other interesting thing though, is almost no one, Bug Bounty, uh, APT, Ransomware Group, you name it, almost no one will develop a proof of concept for a vulnerability that's published. Almost exclusively people work if a proof of concept is published. So um, it does happen that people will make a proof of concept, but usually that's individual researchers who are practicing their exploit writing. And once those people publish it, then the bug bounty people, then the APT groups, then the you name it, then they start working on with it. Um, but actually it's kind of interesting that uh, you could uh, like even the Apache exploit, for example, um, the SSRF that came out was disclosed, I think, a month and a half ago, and it took a month and two weeks till someone decided to go and research it and figure out how to make a proof of concept. So it really wasn't right away, um, and it almost got overlooked, but uh, someone realized it would be a good, uh, good finding to take advantage of if they could get a proof of concept working. All right, I think I'll finish off this slide. So uh, the last two points, pay on triage versus pay on fix. So triage is a bug bounty term. It means I, the researcher, send in a vulnerability to HackerOne in a GE website. 
Um, most of HackerOne's customers get HackerOne to review the vulnerabilities. Sometimes they'll review it themselves. Either way, my initial report goes into a new report state. Someone from the company or from the HackerOne triage team then reviews that report to see, is this a legitimate finding? Is this not a legitimate finding? Is Wesley just misunderstanding this issue entirely? Um, how should we consider this? So they review it, and if it's if it's I found the first person to send it in, and it's a legitimate finding, then it gets sent to the company for um, review and acceptance. So depending on the company, they'll either pay you right then. They'll say, yeah, you know, it's been reviewed. It's a valid vulnerability. Here's your payment, and that's called pay on triage. Or they'll say, okay, great, this is a real finding. We're gonna put it in the queue to get uh, worked on and fixed, but um, we're not gonna pay you until we have fixed it. So um, a lot of HackerOne customers take the pay on fix model. Um, Synac, uh, they exclusively do the triage themselves. They don't let customers do triage and they pay on triage. Um, Bug Crowd, um, is a bit of both once again. Usually Bug Crowd does the triage, um, but usually they don't pay until a fix is in place. Um, I haven't worked a ton on Bug Crowd in the last little while, so things could have changed. I can't speak the best to their programs. Um, Microsoft used to pay on fix, um, but I think they pay on triage now. And Google, I'm not sure what they do these days. Um, Usually the only problem with pay on fix versus pay on triage is you can be waiting a long time to get paid out for a finding. Um, in theory, they should still always pay at the end of the day. Um, so it can be more of an issue for people that are expecting a whole bunch of money right away. Uh, but if you have a day job and this is just kind of for fun, um, it can just mean more waiting is the main outcome of that. Um, and then I've already touched on it, but public programs and private programs. So like I said, Synac only runs private programs. You have to get accepted onto their platform before you can see any of them. Uh, BugCrowd and HackerOne, they do a mix. And so um, on HackerOne, I would say something like 1 20th of their customers are public and 19 out of 20 are private uh, programs. And so private programs, you get an invite to so you can work on them. Um, sometimes they give you more access than a public program would have. Sometimes they'll give you newer or different targets than a private program would have. Um, there's some controversy, especially on Hacker One, though, because sometimes they'll just take a private program, which pays for vulnerabilities, and they'll offer it as a public program, which does not, but covers the same scope. So GE will say, hey, we've got a public Hacker One program. You know, we'll give you some points on Hacker One, but mostly this is for disclosure, send in your dishwasher vulnerabilities to us. But if I manage to get an invite to their private program, they'd actually pay me for those same vulnerabilities. So um, the public private model is primarily there just to kind of filter out who does testing on your stuff. <clears throat> for a public program, you have no real way to prove that um, researchers are following your rules. You can list out a whole bunch of rules, but if your public program is just on the internet, um, people can register a VPN, start doing all the types of testing you told them not to, and then when they find something that is allowed, report it through the legitimate account. So that's usually why companies hesitate a bit to go fully public with their stuff. On the other hand, places like Microsoft and Google, they're used to people trying to attack their stuff all day long. So they don't really mind if all of their stuff is public. All right, so um, my next slide is gonna be on getting started, but is there any questions that I should go over before that? I'll take silence as no. Oh wait, there's there's chat bubbles moving. I'm not reading them. Onward. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, some of you might have already kind of looked into bounty programs already. Might have already started on them. I'm not sure. Uh, if you haven't, 
the first step really is signing up. I mean, you can try to start hacking on Google or Microsoft and it is possible you'll find something, uh, but they're uh, more challenging targets than you'll probably find otherwise. So um, for sign up, uh, both BugCrowd and HackerOne let you just register an account. You go right now, hackerone.com, be like, hey, I wanna be a new tester, uh, make yourself a profile. Um, the best move if you're registering on Hacker One is to also look at their Hacker 101 uh, program. And actually, I recommend this to anyone, um, even people that are pretty experienced in web security testing, uh, mobile security testing. They've kind of done something similar to what uh, the Port Swigger team has done with their um, web application labs that they make public. Um, Hacker One realized. Hey, you know, we really like the idea of bug bounties and just people coming to try and hack stuff. The more diverse set of people you get looking at a target, the better findings you get. But they also realized, hey, a lot of people like this idea, but they're really new to computer security and they really still have a ton to learn. It'd be great if we could educate them as they're doing their testing. So what they did is they uh, made a bunch of like, you could call them like mini CTFs, like mini challenges that you can try and hack. Some of them are super easy. Some of them are actually, they take some, they take some effort to kind of figure out what, what steps you need to get to the result they're looking for. <clears throat> um, and they cover quite a range of stuff. When they initially started, it was just a few of your basic web type vulnerabilities. Now I know they have mobile apps and other things like that. Um, the incentive that they have for all of this is when you complete any of their levels, each time you get a flag or some number of flags, I know they were restructuring it a few times they'll send you a private program invite. So I think they'll do one a day or something like that. So you can each day pick a different hacker 101 target. Um, chances are you'll actually learn something, which is good, uh, but also you'll get an invite to a private program. So that could be your first kind of great target to start working on for trying out bug bounties. Um, and it makes it pretty accessible to everyone. Uh, I think you know, you'll cap out at maybe 20 private programs eventually, and that'll be that but that, that's a much better starting set than only their public programs. Uh, seeing a bunch of comments, but I'm gonna, gonna see if I can share my other window. Here we go. Okay. So HackerOne website, you don't even have to actually log in to see their, uh, ooh, it says it's paused, Zoom, there we go. Okay, hopefully you guys all see the HackerOne website. Um, one of the interesting things to look at when starting out is how you can get more invites to the private programs. Uh, the reason you really want the private programs is because they have less people testing them, so there's gonna be more stuff you can find. You can stick to public programs only and only ever hack those, but you're kind of really making your life a lot harder than it needs to be. So to get onto the private programs, you need invites on bug crowd. You get an invite for vulnerability you send in. Hacker one, you get invites based on vulnerabilities you send in. On Synac, mostly you just, you're good to go, but they're kind of the exception to the rule. So uh, the technique, the approach that a ton of people take when starting off, especially on Hacker One is they pick the program US Department of Defense. If you look there, it says they've resolved uh, uh, 17,790 reports. Um, that's not an exaggeration. There was seven, 17,000 vulnerabilities in US military systems uh, that have been reported, accepted, and fixed um, on Hacker One. The catch here is they don't pay anything. So you get to hack a dot mill and get nothing. Um, but in theory, you don't get black fans showing up at your house. So that's a good thing. Um, I always recommend a VPN, but that's up to you. Um, Yahoo though, they've also had 10,000 resolved issues. They pay for all their issues. Um, so they've paid out a ton of money. Um, actually, if we click on them, it'll tell us how much they've paid out. What do you think it is? I'm guessing 10 million. Oh, 21 million total bounty paid. So they've been running for quite a few years. I think they probably pay out a couple million a year on their bounty program. 
Um, they have a really wide scope. So that is why they've got so many issues. Um, another popular target is AT&T. Um, they were one of the original companies that were doing bounty programs. They used to have like the most insane model ever where they would pick their top five vulnerabilities each quarter and pay for them and everyone else would get nothing. So you had to find something really great and they'd pay you like a hundred bucks. Uh, but I guess they saw the flaw in their ways. So now they pay for vulnerabilities, but their scope, as far as I remember, is anything AT&T owned uh, and managed, they'll pay you for. So yeah, and here's their payment category. So you get paid more on a bug bounty depending on how significant of a vulnerability it is. So a low would be, I don't know, you've got some directory contents listed, nothing sensitive, but you know you shouldn't have directory contents listed. Medium might be uh, something like a reflected cross site scripting attack vulnerability. So you got to get someone to click a link and then in theory you can execute JavaScript against them, but you can't necessarily take over their account. So like a low impact cross-site scripting. High would be um, like a stored cross-site scripting um, or uh, lots of permissions types issues are often considered high. So if I have an insecure direct object reference, I can use my ID and access your ID. Um, that usually falls into high. And then critical is things like SQL injection, remote code execution, uh, those types of things. And I was looking to see what their scope is. Yeah, so they actually don't list what their scope is in terms of this is our scope. They just say everything's in scope except for these systems. Don't hack those ones. Uh, anyway, so anyone can go look at this site. You guys might have already looked at it. Um, PayPal is actually a cool example. So they've got a public program, and it's very similar to their private program. And on their public program, if you find a critical vulnerability, they'll pay you $20,000 or up to $20,000. Uh, but even for a high, they'll pay $10,000. Um, so they have some pretty high payouts. Um, and they still have a lot of reports, relatively speaking. They've got 1,200 reports resolved, and they've paid out six million during their time on Hacker One. Um, so a, site, a target like this is going to be a lot harder to find a vulnerability in than the Department of Defense, for better or for worse, uh, and is going to be more difficult to find a target in than like AT and T, uh, but it's going to pay a lot more. So kind of based on payout ranges and depending on scope and depending on the types of things that you're good at testing and the bug bounty world you can start to prioritize where you think you might want to focus your testing time oh yeah let's see if i can go back to this there's a question about the reports and write-ups. Uh, do you always have to write up a big formal report like would be done in a pen test or how does that go with bug bounties? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually I completely didn't even think of it when I was writing up slides. Um, so I think this is a huge advantage of bug bounties. Unless, like we were discussing earlier, if you're like a governance person and you like just live off of writing lots of paperwork at a customer once and uh, they're like, oh, we got to go get this report printed. And we're like, okay. And they're like, yeah, I'll be, I'll be back from the store like after lunch. And we we're like, well, what's wrong with the printer here? Is it broken? They're like, no, no, this customer, like they, they weigh the report. They look at how thick it is. And if it's not thick enough, they don't feel they've got a good value. Uh, bug bounties are the opposite. So especially on Hacker One, they just really don't care how good your report is. If you just include five bullet points, do this, do this, do this, do this, and that demonstrates your vulnerability, um, that's usually good enough. Um, the flip side is the Hacker One triage staff is really bad at following five steps. So you usually want to include some screenshots and maybe a video, um, and then they have a better time of doing it. So um, with bug bounties, it's really similar to what you might file in a bug tracker. And it's kind of the opposite of what you might produce for an executive summary in your pen test report. Um, usually, yeah, usually I would say my reports have maybe three paragraphs of description and then just vulnerability steps after that. So it's actually very concise. 
Can you speak to the other side, the percentage of bug, uh, the percentages that bug bounty platforms take and the way they treat their customers regarding support? Yeah, and that's actually a very interesting uh, program to program how they do it. Um, I have never been a bug bounty customer, so I mostly just know what I've heard from others, um, friends of mine, people I've worked with, that type of thing, what they've experienced. So um, from what I understand, HackerOne charges a flat fee to register as a customer, have your program available. From what I understand, they charge a lot more if you want your program to be public than if you want it to be private. And um, they then make you as the customer pay out each vulnerability from your own money. So that, that, that can be good and bad because it can mean that if you're not getting any findings, at least you're not paying for them. Although you are paying a fairly significant cost to be listed in the first place, um, you know, tens of thousands of dollars at least, maybe more. Um, and then you pay for vulnerability on top of that. Um, Bug Crowd, I believe, follows a similar model uh, where you pay to be a customer and also pay for vulnerabilities. Um, both of those companies also charge you a different rate depending on who's doing the vulnerability triage. So HackerOne has a team of staff that will review each vulnerability so that you really only get approved vulnerabilities and you could ignore the rest. Uh, but you can choose to do the triage yourself. And I believe that you save some costs that way. Um, on the other hand, then you're responsible for figuring out each report. Um, the kind of downside to bug bounties is that there is a lot of throw it against the wall and see what sticks. Um, because depending where you live in the world, if you send in a thousand reports and you get paid a hundred dollars for one of the thousand, that was still worthwhile because that's a hundred dollars. So some people try that. Um, the platforms try and get rid of just kind of spam reports, I guess you'd call them, uh, but that's still a, a problem. The other problem is doing bounty triage is sometimes harder than finding the vulnerability in the first place because there's a lot of nuances to what makes a vulnerability actually a problem that we can and need to fix versus just misunderstanding how the system's supposed to work and it truly is by design and truly is not a vulnerability um, or it truly is a duplicate vulnerability of something you already know discerning that can also be quite challenging so usually companies probably should just rely on the uh, bug triage from the bounty programs um, yeah and then synac is a bit different from what i understand they have a variety of different things they'll sell you. But as far as I know, for all of them, you pay a flat rate and they use the rate that you're paying to pay out the researchers. And so eventually Synac actually will cap off uh, the vulnerabilities that can be submitted to a program. If you've used up too much of its budget, they'll basically say, hey, we're not taking any more vulnerabilities for this target. <clears throat> uh, the downside is if you, pay a bunch of money to be listed on Synac and you get no uh, vulnerabilities submitted, um, you're not getting a lot for your money. Uh, there's another question. I noticed that there's some companies out there that don't, that don't offer uh, bug, or they don't have bug bounty programs. Can you test against them and hope that they might pay you anyways, or do people do it out of boredom? Yeah, and so that's another huge technique among bounty hunters, I'll call them. Uh, security researchers, we could call them. Um, so I mentioned earlier, you want to get on the private programs because they have less people testing them, usually have more stuff to find. Uh, basically, they're less well-tested attack surface. So if you've got a super well-tested attack surface, it's going to be hard to find something. Um, so what's even better than a private program is a company that just doesn't have a program. Probably no one's tested it, except for maybe people trying to ransomware them. Uh, so you can find all kinds of easy vulnerabilities if you just pick companies that don't have a bounty or um, if you go outside of the bounty testing scope. So that actually is another bug bounty insider secret that I can share. Um, so some companies like say Synac 
uh, they'll ban you from the platform if you test outside of the scope of what their customers have asked. So if their customers say, don't touch the admin panel and you go to the admin panel, uh, they'll track it back to you, hopefully. Um, and then they'll, you know, kick you off for a week or a month or for a lifetime, depending how many rules you've broken and how significant it is. Uh, other companies like Hacker One, they have this thing that they call laterals. So they might say, okay, here's your set of IPs that are in scope, or here's your set of domain names that are in scope. <clears throat> and so if you, uh, some tools will actually even do it for you. They look up the domain name, they resolve it back to an IP, and then they test the five IPs in front of it <clears throat> and the five IPs behind it. So not associated with that domain name, and if it's like a cloud hosted system, you could be testing anyone's IP space. But if it's just uh, network IP blocks that someone has, maybe you're still testing company owned systems. So HackerOne for the most part thinks that's super cool if you can just find other systems of a customer to hack. Um, and so a bunch of HackerOne customers will say, here's the scope of what you're allowed to test. But if you find something really important outside of that, you know, you hacked a GE airplane, even though you weren't supposed to be hacking airplanes, uh, we'll still pay you for it. So it really incentivizes a bunch of researchers to go looking at things they're not, that aren't in scope. And then tons of people take that further and just test companies that don't have a bounty program at all. Uh, the problem with testing companies that don't have a bounty program at all is you are violating many federal laws. So it's my understanding that if you get a boat and you flag it as some like Caribbean company country or something, and you go into international waters and use a cellular link, don't think you can be extradited. But otherwise, if you hack a company and they get real mad, they can bring criminal charges against you. Um, I think it's happened on the rare occasion. I haven't heard of it happening to any company that actually does have a bounty program that they've pressed criminal charges against anyone. Um, but it's definitely like you're taking that risk. And so the problem is you can report it to a company and if you want to get paid, you have to let them know your real name or you have to say, I want to get paid in Bitcoin. But if you say, Hey, I've got this vulnerability. Can you pay me in Bitcoin? You're starting to really enter the realm of, Hey, and I also do ransomware as a part-time job. And then you're going to be on other people's list of getting in trouble with. So I would advise against it. People do it. Um, people do get paid doing that. A lot of companies are like, well, what do we do? He found an issue. Maybe we should pay him. Um, so you could do that, but I think it's, I think it's extremely risky. Except on hacker one, they're, they're totally cool with you just hacking any of their customers out of school. I don't get it. Uh, in the list of those, uh, programs on hacker one, there was labels saying splitting and retesting. What does it mean? Yeah. So splitting is what, uh, was talked about earlier, our groups of people doing hacking. Um, <clears throat> splitting just means you can split your payment. Some customers don't like the idea of that, or they specifically, um, I think, I think though a concern that some customers have is that you're on the private program, but your three friends aren't, so they don't want you trying to split across them. Otherwise, I think if they're fine with people, um, having a group of, having a group of them doing testing, then they'll enable splitting. It just means you can split the payment so it doesn't just go to you uh, the problem with payment just going to me um and i mean i could talk a whole bunch about it but uh this is income so you got to pay taxes on it and so if i get income i got to pay taxes on it and then i want to give it to my friend now i'm just giving money to my friend i either have to try and bill him as an expense and have an incorporated company to write that off of or at least be filing um as a sole proprietor and listing it as business expense or basically you're paying taxes on it twice because he's getting paid and he's got to pay taxes on his income and you got paid and you already paid tax on that income. So it just kind of sucks from a tax perspective if you have to split it yourself. Uh, retesting is uh, just a feature offered to customers. So I find the vulnerability in the GE dishwasher. GE says, hey, we think we fixed it. <clears throat> Can you retest? And so they'll pay you 50 bucks to test, does the fix work? Um, so as long as you can do that test in, you know, 10 minutes or less, 50 bucks works out pretty well. If you have to buy a whole new dishwasher and do a bunch of stuff, you probably just say, no, I don't want to retest. Um, and BugCrowd and Synac offer that too.
Um, how about I keep going for a bit here? So um, in terms of getting started, like I said, 90% of it's web applications. <clears throat> so if you've never tested web applications, you really got to start with Hacker 101. If you've done a ton of web application testing, uh, then you should be familiar with the only tool required, which is Burp Suite. Um, actually, people were talking about it earlier, but I find that doing some sort of directory enumeration is super useful too. So uh, GoBuster, WFuzz, that kind of thing, um, I would strongly recommend. But really, actually, there's a million optional tools. There's a million plugins for Burp Suite. If you really want, you can use Zap Proxy or you know something else. But basically, all you really need is an intercepting proxy. Um, I thought about what your advanced testing the thought methodology should be to succeed in the bug bounty world. So made this circle. And it is enumerate, test, exploit, and expand. Sounds pretty good, right? Uh, but basically what I've found is um, before you can really start testing a website, a web application, it's really helpful to understand what all the uh, paths are within it what all the features are, what all the functions are, and as much as possible, what they're supposed to do, um, and then start testing those. So you'll kind of know what you're looking for in terms of proms. Inevitably, you'll find something you can exploit. Um, and I often find that once I've kind of started on it, found an issue, then I know where to expand. Hey, this app has SQL injection vulnerabilities. So let's really focus on that. So then do more enumeration, more testing. Or hey, this app has a lot of permissions issues or has at least one permission issue. So maybe there's more. So I think of testing against these targets as kind of a cycle. Um, enumerate and test. If you're getting nowhere, uh, move on. So that's, I think, on my next slide here, strategy. Uh, so is there any questions or should I talk a little bit about some of these strategy points? I haven't seen any questions in the chat. Okay. <clears throat> so... Um, I made some triangles of what you can prioritize as you do bug bounty testing. So uh, some people, <clears throat> in terms of goals, they just want to get paid. Some people, in terms of goals, uh, really just want to learn. Um, and uh, all the platforms offer uh, recognition in some way. Microsoft used to, maybe they still do, a top... 50 researchers each year. They, they post a big list up at Black Hat. <clears throat> I was researcher number 99 one year and my name was up there and then everyone told me. So I never went to go see it. Um, Hacker One has their leaderboard, like I had said. Bugcrowd has a leaderboard. Synac has a leaderboard. Um, so some people's goal is really to make, uh, get as many points as possible instead of necessarily getting paid as much as possible. Um, and then your other goal might be to do some of the challenges. So HackerOne runs uh, live events that you can be invited to go participate in in person. Um, a lot of the bounty programs will do time-bound challenges from time to time. Uh, so Synac one time uh, did a challenge where the person who found the most vulnerabilities won a Tesla. Um, so that might be your goal to work on. You want to win a free car. Um, so when when you're kind of moving from just kind of scratching the surface of bug bounties to wanting to do it more um, i recommend you think about what your uh what your goal is is your goal to get as many points is your goal to get as much pay is your goal to win as many challenges uh and then kind of direct your focus based on that so that ties in a little bit to the next triangle um, on Hacker One, especially a little bit on Synac, and I really don't know what Bugcrowd does, but <clears throat> Hacker One assigns points based on number of vulnerabilities. You get more points for a critical vulnerability than you do a low impact vulnerability, um, but it's not that significant. So, to win in terms of points on Hacker One, uh, you need to get quantity of vulnerabilities. So, on the Hacker One scoreboard, the top uh, three people all rely heavily on automation. They actually don't do a ton of manual testing. They instead are on tons and tons of targets and they run automated tests 24 hours a day. Uh, like the top guy was talking in a chat recently that I was on and he's got uh, five computers in his basement just running Burp Suite on auto scan mode 24 seven. 
Um, and then he's got a script, I believe, uh, to automatically interact with the Hacker One APIs and just send in vulnerabilities as they're found. So no actual manual work done at all. Um, another tester that I know, uh, I think he was in the top 10 last quarter. He was explaining how um, he does automated testing. He does a lot of subdomain finding, looking for misconfigurations, things like that. <clears throat> and so he um, was in the top 10 at HackerOne, uh, but the amount of pay that he got that quarter was much less than many of the people in the top 20, the top 50. Many of the people under him in points had gotten paid a lot more because they had high <clears throat> paying vulnerabilities, but a low quantity of them. So um, maybe to go back to that other triangle, why might you want any of those things? Um, I think challenges can be great to really kind of push yourself, see if you can uh, win when competing against other people. Pay obviously is, you know, just money. Um, extra money is always great. I think that's probably the coolest thing about bug bounties is it's a little bit like the gig economy um, for computer security, <clears throat> um, you know, kind of like being an Uber driver, I guess. Uh, but you can actually like choose just to spend an hour every couple of evenings and chances are you'll find a vulnerability that's worth a thousand dollars. Um, so a few hours of work, you learn something and you get a thousand bucks. That could be pretty great, um, for not much investment. So I think the pay is always kind of worth considering. It can end up being some really easy money. Um, it can definitely be frustrating at times because you can do a bunch of testing and get nothing, but um, it, it also goes the other way just as easily. Uh, points, though, um, points can be uh, points and recognition, I guess, can be very valuable um, depending where you are in your career and what you're looking to do. <clears throat> so, something cool that Hacker One has is they have a job board for all of the companies that you're. Um, doing testing against. So they have one, I guess, for public companies, but every private program you're in, that company can choose to post job postings. Um, and you'll see them if you're registered to that testing target. And so, um, you know, say I wanted a job for GE, um, maybe not making their dishwashers, but working on their security team, <clears throat> which is a funny joke because I worked for GE briefly. Um, but say I did, I could participate in their Hacker One program if they had one. And uh, in theory, I might want to try and get a ton of points on that program uh, before I apply for a job, because then I could reference, hey, I got a ton of points on your program. And I know um, a lot of the people that do bug bounties reference it on their LinkedIn, put it on their resume, uh, you know, as a top 10 hacker at whatever program during this month, or I'm in these Hall of Fames or that type of thing. Um, so, uh, kind of like a real world example of some of your skills and experience. Um, so I know a lot of people use it for that reason. And if it was me and I was the hiring manager, if you had a cert versus if you had some bug bounty uh, volumes you could talk about, I'd, I'd way rather see the bug bounty volumes. Um, so I think that is actually a pretty practical reason you might wanna just even ignore the points or even ignore the pay and just work on free programs but get some experience reporting real vulnerabilities. Um, back to this other strategy triangle. Um, so automation is one approach um, where basically you can pick a type of vulnerability that you see out there, <clears throat> write some tools, integrate some tools usually. You usually don't have to write the tools, you usually just have to integrate them and set it up so that you can automate the manual testing steps that you might do. Manual testing is, you know, point and clicking using Burp Suite, uh, anything that you can't automate easily. And what would my other slide say here? Enumeration. Um, yeah, an enumeration kind of goes to how long do you want to spend on anything. So the more you enumerate a target, the more you'll understand it, the more you'll have ideas of where to look for. Um, and so each of these things you can prioritize more or less time on and will lead you to kind of some different findings. That's all pretty high level, but from what I've found, these are kind of your three goals you can have in bounties and your three kind of ways you can try to get to findings. And I know some of the top bounty people 
focus on automation. I know other top bounty people and they focus manual testing and I know other top bounty people and they're just super good at enumeration and finding a tax surface that no one else has ever seen. So all three can lead you to success. Uh, I'm gonna go on to a real bounty strategy unless anyone else has some questions. I think we're good. Okay. <clears throat> so um, whether you're new to bounties or kind of in the thick of it, I think the first and most important thing is to set your goals before you jump right into the testing. So I know some people and they're like, hey, I love this idea of bug bounties. I'm good at testing. <clears throat> I'm going to go do bug bounties. Um, and that's that's fine and good. And like you need some enthusiasm, but I think you need to really pick what you want to accomplish um, and kind of break it into manageable chunks uh, because it's super easy to get overwhelmed and lost in the flood of possible targets and payment systems and recognition systems and, and so on and so on and so on. So if you're brand new to bug bounties, I would say things like, set your goals as complete three of the hacker 101 challenges. And then once you've done that, set your goal as picking, as reading through uh, 20 public programs to pick one that you wanna work on and then picking what type of vulnerability you wanna look for. Don't make it your goal, I wanna find three of these vulns and get paid for them. Uh, make it your goal, I wanna successfully test for these. <clears throat> um, and, I also think it's useful to, to try and focus as much as possible, especially at the beginning, on what type of thing you want to look for. Um, there's actually hundreds of different web vulnerabilities that you can find, um, and some of them you can kind of test for all at the same time, but a lot of them you need to prioritize your testing time onto specifically. So um, I think that's the most important starting point is if you define a goal then you can know if you've successfully worked towards it if you don't have a goal the problem is you can spend weeks months years doing bounty testing and never get an accepted finding because there's just so much to look at and it's so easy to get lost and jumping from one thing to the next and never never really getting to where you want to be uh the next thing i'd say is don't spend longer on doing your tooling than you do on your testing so this is a little bit less true if, you, if your plan is to just go 100% automation. But even if you're planning to go automation, I think the starting point always should be doing a small scale proof of concept, <clears throat> figuring out, hey, is this vulnerability actually out there enough that it's worth automating? Um, but I know some people, they want to <clears throat> buy five servers, get them set up, get three VPN connections going so that they can load balance across them. And then they run around 20 Burp Street instances. Uh, <clears throat> but really all you needed to do is just launch Burp and do some testing to start out with. Um, same kind of thing for trying out new tools. Um, some people like to put the tools first and then figure out what they're gonna test. They like to amass a big collection of cool tools to try out. Um, but actually, I feel like you should understand why you want a tool before you invest a bunch of time into figuring it out and trying it. Uh, definitely don't just get stuck with old tools that aren't any good and there's better options, uh, but balance your time is what I would say. Uh, especially if your goal is to get lots of findings or to get paid for your findings. Um, and that's gonna tie into my last point here on time boxing everything, but uh, with bounty programs, you're always constantly thinking of where do I draw the line between doing more of any one activity or moving on. Uh, focus on the less travel paths. This has been super successful for me. Um, if I were to go and hack GE, I would not go to GE.com and just try to start hacking all the form fields. Um, I would start looking for well, what's the scope <clears throat> and is there an old GE mobile website that everyone forgot about but is still running, um, take a look at that. Uh, also, the more difficult and 
uh, how to describe it, the more difficult and frustrating it is to use a portion of a website or a portion of an application, the more likely it is that no one's actually tested that part of it. Um, and probably that no one even understands that part of the application. So <clears throat> if you're testing a bank and you test, you know, sending money from one account to another, that's probably really well tested. But if you're testing, um, doing a bulk import of bills to pay, and it's got to be in this bank specific format that you've never heard of, and then it parses your file and it always gives you an error if it's not just perfect. That's probably the one to look at where you got to really figure out, well, how do I even get this to work in the first place? Probably no one else has looked at that part of it. So if you want to pick one area to spend your time on, sometimes picking the more frustrating parts of the application is actually the best one to look at because everyone else has just given up. Uh, private programs, I think I talked about that a bunch already. Um, <clears throat> public programs, there are some exceptions, uh, Yahoo and PayPal being great examples. They primarily run a public program. So you'll find lots of good stuff on there. Uh, most companies though, they run their stuff as a private program. <clears throat> and the biggest benefit of the private program is there's a more limited set of researchers, um, which means that you've got better odds at finding something that someone else hasn't. Uh, time-tested techniques and new attack vectors. Uh, so we talked about this a little bit uh, with the talk on ODAs, but <clears throat> um, some of the techniques that I use for web application testing are the exact same that I used 20 years ago. Um, some of them are completely brand new. Uh, someone mentioned the uh, HTTP request splitting, I think was mentioned. Uh, that's a new one. Some of the HTTP slash two uh, protocol vulnerabilities are brand new ones. And so um, some testers like to really just focus on the newest exploit, the newest ODE, and ignore the time-tested techniques. <clears throat> and some people like to ignore all the new research and the new techniques. Um, I think everyone would have the best success using a mixture of the two. So I always try and stay aware of what's happening and what's new, uh, but I don't necessarily only work on that. Um, I think a lot of the techniques that worked 10 years ago are still gonna stay working another 20 years from now. Uh, things like permission issues are just gonna be super difficult to ever fully solve because it requires human intervention to say, yes, this is the right permission. Computers have a hard time of just knowing what you want it to do. Uh, my last point, oh no, last point, second last point, don't listen to bug bounty Twitter. <clears throat> so maybe someone's come to this talk and they've seen so many Twitter threads on, hey, I got paid a million dollars and I bought a car or do this one technique and you'll get tons of findings. Um, from just about everything I've seen on that, it's usually wrong in the first place is like the first thing to keep in mind. But even if it's not wrong, um it can just be super discouraging um because uh, even for me like i'm super successful at bug bounties i feel and when i see people posting on twitter hey i just did this and i got a great finding i always feel like oh i should have done that already uh why didn't i do that i wish i was like this person um <clears throat> and it's just pretty easy to get frustrated and do way too much, spend way too much time comparing yourself to other people's successes. So um, I would say if you're looking for new techniques and new things to try, uh, focus on things like Hacker 101 or the Port Swigger uh, Web Security Labs or just training courses, um, or try out exploits and things that people are publishing you themselves. But don't just try and follow the latest thing that someone posts on Twitter and says, hey, this works, this will get you vulnerabilities. Um, I've had actually people message me, hey, what tool do you use for such and such technique? Um, and I'm like, oh, what's that technique? And then they explain it. And I'm like, oh, well, I just don't do that. And like, this was super surprising to them because they thought, oh, I've heard so much about this on Twitter. It's got to be like everyone's doing it. Um, and so I thought about the technique, like, oh, am I wrong? And it was a valid technique, I guess, but I haven't seen it 
in very many applications. So uh, <clears throat> just because something sounds like it's super popular doesn't mean it's actually out there a lot in the real world. Um, I would say for every minute you spend on bug bounty Twitter, it'd be way better to spend 59 minutes on actually just testing out some targets and seeing what you find. Uh, and then that is a uh, good mention too, time box everything. So <clears throat> if you've got an hour that you're gonna spend on bounty testing, uh, spend your time wisely. Um, for me, and I think tons of people that do computer security, the biggest limiting factor is the time that you have available to spend on things. And bug bounties make that especially true. Um, so unlike pen testing, unlike application testing, unlike exploit development, you really want to go broad and wide, and you really don't have a lot of time to go deep. <clears throat> so I can find a super great remote code execution vulnerability in GE's website, but they're going to pay me whatever a critical gets paid for on their bounty target, and that's it. Now, if it's uh, PayPal, I've got a lot more room because, uh, like I just showed, PayPal pays $20,000 for a critical. So that's, that's a great payment. I can spend some time on that. <clears throat> but uh, AT&T, they cap out at $2,000. So if I'm spending a month and I get paid $2,000, that wasn't a good use of my time. Um, so <clears throat> I think it's worthwhile being really aware of how much time it's going to take before you find something. And so this actually, I think, is what discourages a lot of InfoSec professionals from doing bug bounties, is you never really are afforded the time to do good testing. You really have to limit yourself to quick testing. Um, you never can really get to the point where you say, hey, this website has no vulnerabilities, because to be sure of that, the time you have to invest to find the last 10% of vulnerabilities would never pay itself off. Um, so that's why uh, bug bounties can have a little bit of a bad rep for uh, <clears throat> only having trivial vulnerabilities ever get found. It's not that bug bounty testers can only find trivial vulnerabilities. I know a bunch of testers that are super good InfoSec people, <clears throat> and they'd be great pen testers, they'd be great exploit developers, um, but they're doing bug bounties. Um, but they too will focus on what can I find in a short period of time. If you can find a critical vulnerability super fast, that's great. But sometimes it's way better to focus on finding the high paying ones only, high as the step under critical, ignoring the criticals, uh, but cycling through targets really fast because it be becomes a matter of getting just finding the right target versus trying to exploit each target. Um, and that's the great thing about bug bounties right now. Uh, back when they launched in 2013, there was like maybe 30 companies in the whole world that you could do a bug bounty against. So you really had a limited scope. Uh, but then by the next year, there's, you know, a couple hundred that you could test against. And now there's thousands of potential targets. Um, each of the companies often has multiple targets within them. You know, GE would have their dishwashers and their website and their whatever else they make. <clears throat> so now the limiting factor is actually just what do you want to start on next? There's always some cost to trying out a new system, but I find it super useful to try and balance how much time you spend before you move on. There's a bunch of questions, Wes. <clears throat> do you go after the low hanging fruit or specialize in certain volumes when hunting? Yeah, and actually this is my last real slide. So I got tons of time for questions now. I got a few spicy memes if we need them. Uh, <clears throat> tons of time, you mean 11 minutes, right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, so for me, I usually, sorry, what was the question? I'm halfway there. Um, do you go after the low hanging fruit or do you specialize in certain volumes? Yeah. Um, so I don't really specialize. I test a ton of stuff. Uh, some people like really like to do cross-site scripting. I know one guy, he, he prioritizes SQL injection. He like almost only tests that. Um, I definitely am aiming for the low hanging fruit. Uh, for me, if I can't exploit a system in two days, usually I move on. Um, so whatever definition of low hanging fruit that is, 
Um, I find that I do really well finding a lot of permissions issues. Um, so just <clears throat> missing authorization or incorrect authorization on API endpoints, I find a ton of. Uh, but yeah, I'll do everything, remote code execution, SQL injection, you name it. Um, also, depending on the target, I'll try and find a copy of a web application, um, especially something that's not open source, and then decompile it, see if I can find any obvious issues. <clears throat> but I always try and kind of time bound it in a, in a few hours up to maybe a couple of days. Do you need to worry about getting blocked by IDS, uh, especially if you run a lot of automation? Yeah, so that depends a bit. <clears throat> so the companies that have the staging environments, especially, they'll often whitelist it so that you don't get blocked when you're doing testing. Um, other companies, they'll be like, oh, well, you know, we're finding a lot of cross-site scripting issues. And so we talked to our IT team and they bought a WAF and now the WAF will just block you if you try anything bad. <clears throat> and then sure enough, their website's still full of issues, uh, SQL injection, you name it. But the WAF blocks many attacks. Um, so that's actually companies feel like is part of their security platform, even though eventually WAFs have bypasses and people get around all of it and then it's a big problem. Um, I found that I usually only have issues when things are hosted on Amazon because uh, Amazon's, uh, what is it? Not Cloudflare, their other one. Anyways, their, their load balancing service, um, it has a lot of default rules that'll block you after you've done too many bad requests in a row. Um, so that can be annoying because I'm not even necessarily doing uh, high rates of tests. Um, I do a mix of automated and manual tests. I'm a big fan of burp active scan, a big fan of directory enumeration, but then also a big fan of manual testing. Um, so when those types of systems are in place, really only manual testing works. And then depending on how aggressive the WAF is, sometimes it really actually only means that you can test for permissions issues and everything else gets your session banned. Um, I know some people will spin up a bunch of VPN IP addresses to get around some of that. Uh, but for me, usually that's just a sign that it's too much hassle to be worth it. And I'll just move on to a different target. Mark, if you feel your question about sunk costs haven't been answered yet, um, shout out and uh, otherwise I'll skip it. Uh, what was your highest bounty payout? Um, I think my highest We were bounty... bound to have that question, weren't we? Oh, man. I, think, I think it was when I hacked uh, Hotmail, which apparently is not called Hotmail anymore, but uh, they call it, I don't know, Outlook.com or something. Um, so sometimes programs will run bonuses, well, pretty often actually, they'll run bonuses and incentives. So this was uh, actually pretty early when I was starting into doing bounties, maybe 2015. <clears throat> um, Microsoft was doing a double bounty promotion for anything on their authentication endpoints. Uh, so I found a cross-site request forgery vulnerability that would basically let me <clears throat> gain OAuth authorization to anyone's uh, account that was a Microsoft account. I had thought it was only affecting their Outlook service, but they later told me that that's their, you know, live.com authentication system. It's used for everything, especially internally. So if you could convince someone to click a malicious link or go to your uh, website, you could trigger the authorization behind the scenes. The user would never see anything and you could gain full control of their account. Um, so I should probably look it up. I think they paid me $30,000 and I think that's the highest I've been paid. I'm going to double check. Uh, interesting regarding the race against time. As you alluded to, you can't go all the way. You need to submit quickly. Can you speak to when you make the decision to make the submission? Uh, yeah, so usually I try to <clears throat> just double check that I'm not missing something much better that would make my vulnerability a lot more high impact. So say I find a permissions issue, <clears throat> I'd probably double check quickly that the same issue doesn't affect the 
maybe the login endpoint or the doesn't let me change my account to admin, say. So I try and explore the impact a little bit. Uh, but since bounties are always first person to get submit, first person to get paid, um, I really don't try, I really try not to hold on to the, any of my findings very much. I try and send them in as fast as possible. Um, nothing prevents you from sending in follow-up vulnerabilities. So if you have something unique that you find afterwards, uh, then you can send that in. So usually I try and write them up, send them in as soon as I find, uh, as soon as I get something working. And then often, uh, like in my fancy circle diagram, then I'll often go back, do more exploring, see if I can find something. If I end up finding the exact same thing, but a better impact, um, you can add that as a note to your submission on HackerOne um, or on a place like Synac, you can just do a whole new one and tell them, hey, my old one missed an important part. I discovered you can do all these other things. Um, so usually I try and submit it right away. Uh, often I'll try the obvious things and then move on. Um, I try not to dig, keep digging a hole too far on one vulnerability. I try and kind of move on once I feel like I've done the basics and checking for anything related, then I just try and move on. Any advice for people working full time and wanting to do bug bounty in their free time? Yeah, so like I said, I think setting goals is important. Think about what you want to do. Do you want to just learn something? Do you want to... <clears throat> Do you want to just have the fun of trying to hack Microsoft? Um, something like that, right? Um, and then otherwise, um, if you're hoping like, oh, I just really want to get paid something from it or there's no point, <clears throat> um, I think you have to just be prepared to dedicate enough time to get through the account registration and <clears throat> reading about the scope and looking at the list of accepted vulnerabilities. Uh, but then otherwise, yeah, I mean, I know a bunch of people and they're actually like, oh, I'm just tired always because I go to work for eight hours a day and then I come home and there's so many new good bounty targets to work on and I'm getting paid just as much doing my work as I am doing my bounties. Like these guys are just raking in the money, I guess. Um, but it's, it's a time limiting factor. So um, that's something always to keep in mind too. I mean, if you're a college student and you've got spare time in between your courses then maybe you can put a bunch of time towards bug bounties. If you're working full time and you got a family and all kinds of other commitments, uh, maybe you're not gonna have uh, eight hours a day, every day on the weekend and evenings and all of that. Like you need to be realistic with your time too. Um, I'd say as long as you can dedicate at least an hour in any given period of time, you got a chance to find something. If you've got a less, if you got a shorter period of time than that, that's not great. Uh, for me, I'd rather have, you know, just four hours one day and nothing the rest of the week than an hour each day, uh, but that's more personal preference. How do you deal with uh, dry spells? Where you go, where do you go and what do you do to stay positive? Uh, usually I do like, I don't know, some projects in my house or something, do the laundry. <laughs> uh, I find like when I'm having a lot of success I have a hard time uh taking a break from it because I know I can just spend a little bit more time and I'll find some more stuff uh inevitably that means I got a bunch of uh errands and chores that I'm behind on so that helps a little bit also um I find I'm always really encouraged as soon as I find something even if it's not big um so if it's if it's been a really rough stretch I just try and pick a new program maybe something that's really easy but doesn't pay as much uh, but it just kind of encourages me like, hey, I got something. No, don't worry. This is not going to be a problem. So I think taking breaks is good. Um, and if you haven't taken a break in a while, start with that. But then afterwards, just switch it up, try some new programs, and um, maybe even just purposely pick some easier targets just to give yourself a bit more confidence. All right. That was all the questions that I've recorded. I'm going to stop the recording. Recording. Um, I guess happy, like if Wes, if you still have a little bit of time, we're happy to probably answer a couple more questions. Um, thanks so much for presenting. Really interesting, cool stuff. Great questions. A lot of insights. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me.